you know that this is the first Easter to fall on April Fool's since 1956? I was thinking to myself, I have no memory of Easter ever falling on April Fool's Day in my lifetime, and that's because it had not. I was born in 1972, so see, I'm okay. You guys ever heard of Lee Strobel? He is a, um, he's a famous author now. He um, has written several books, including The Case for the Resurrection, which is an interesting one, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for Creator. Um, and the reason he always titles his books The Case of is because he was an, a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, and he was an atheist. And he was very angry the day that he found out his wife had become a Christian. And this week he posted some things online and he said, you know, at that time in my life, I would have thought it was just good, good humor that Easter fell on April Fool's. Because what a fool you would have to be to believe all of this nonsense. That's what he said. And what I want to do today is I want to tell you a little bit about his story. I want to tell you a whole lot about this story. And let's just, let's just take that. Let's see what it has to say. Let's see what it's all about. But before we do that, we're going to pray because um, if we're just a bunch of fools, then, uh, you know, let's just eat, drink, and be merry and go have some great cinnamon rolls and, and other goodies. Or let's consider the, the feelings that Thomas had that day when he said, I wouldn't believe it unless I stick my hands in, his, in, the, in the nail holes or in his side where the spear had cut him. Please pray with me as we consider this. Father, we thank you for all that you give us. And right now, the question before us is, are we are all a bunch of fools? Is this just a sick April Fool's joke? Or is this the most important thing in all of human history? Is this just sentiments, wishful thinking, myths made up? Or is it the truth? And does it change everything? Lord, we pray to you right now and we ask that you would indeed bring us to this question and that whether we've believed it all of our lives or we sit here and go, yep, it's just a joke. That you would work in this place. That you would come into our presence. That you would cast out the evil and the darkness of this very cold world. And Lord, we pray boldly that you would equip us with the armor of God, the full armor, the boots, of gospel, the boots of the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your righteousness, the helmet of salvation, your salvation accomplished on this day, a shield of faith with which we will extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the spoken Word of God, which we will study and grow in today. And we pray most importantly, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and your perfect peace to be upon us. In the mighty name of Christ, who is risen today. Amen. Was Lee Strobel right when he said, if I, would be, if I had been you know, in that state in my life and I had, we had gone to church on April Fool's Day, I would have smirked? I would have had an extra grin on my face as all these people went and did their little things and the joke was on them. Well, what was interesting about Lee is that what he did is he sought out being an investigative reporter. He was one of the best uh, reporters in Chicago at the time. He, he set out to prove to his wife that it was a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And so he began going to the scholars and going to the archaeology and going to all the evidence. And it got more and more frustrating as he went. Because he's like, oh, it's just all made up. And then he went and he found the facts that, well, it turns out, you know, um, there were some pretty good, interesting facts. And, and the farther he went, he kept running into this problem that all the things, the little caricatures he'd been told or read about didn't match the facts. All the little silly um, anecdotal things that he had heard about how it was all made up didn't match the evidence. He kept running into the fact that there were two billion plus Christians on the earth and that these 12 fishermen had somehow brought this story to the world that toppled even the Roman Empire and it just didn't seem to add up. But that still didn't explain why his wife 
was so different, was so impacted by this story. It didn't explain to him why she was so now very annoying. You know, Christians can be very annoying. I don't know if you guys knew that. I mean, because here's the thing, is the thing we keep talking about this. We keep finding hope in this, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Despite the fact that this world is still filled with death. We keep getting together on Easter Sundays, one right after the other, and we keep saying He is risen. Take a look at John chapter 20, verse 8. We're going to put these on the screen, zoom in on some key words. Finally, John, which I think is hilarious. I don't know if you guys noticed in the story. He always calls himself either the other disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's, I don't know if he's modest or what he's doing, but um, it, John, who was faster than Peter, he does keep that in the story. I think, that, that, I think that's, that's, that's... He gets there first. And he reached the tomb first. He went inside. He saw... And he believed. He put it all together. Because Jesus had told them, this is what's going to happen. But, you know, you know when, when the teacher says things that are all highfalutin, you're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you'll, you'll come around, buddy. You'll, you'll figure this out. No, no. And now, finally, John's like, oh, that's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking about. John, he got here, and he saw, and he believed. Take a look at verse 24. Because there was another disciple who had a very different experience. His name was Thomas, called Didymus. Didymus, Greek word for twin. He was a twin, so I don't know if it was like, you know, Thomas and Robert. I don't know what his twin brother was called, but um, he was one of the twelve, and he was not there when Jesus had come to them on Easter Sunday. Look at verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. See, this is where it starts. This is where it happens. This is where Christians become annoying. We have seen the Lord. And, and, and here's what's interesting, guys, because one of the objections that Lee Strobel had when he was still an atheist and when he was still trying to prove all this, he goes, well, they just made it up. I mean, obviously. But the problem with these disciples who kept saying, we have seen the Lord, is that if they knew that it was a lie, they wouldn't have gone to their deaths proclaiming it. Now you might say, oh Mark, there's lots of people who have died for their faith. We're not talking about faith. They knew the truth one way or the other. They were there. They were the eyewitnesses. You've heard of people who will die for their faith, but you've never heard of anyone who would die for a lie. And these guys keep saying it. We have seen the Lord. We later see in the story that Jesus had appeared to more than 500 people at the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians. And Paul even goes so far as to say, go talk to them. See what they say. We have seen the Lord. Take a look at the next half of that verse, 25. He says, it continues, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, and the Greek word there is balo, it's like throwing my hand into the side, I won't believe it. See, I mean, Lee Strobel was in good company. Thomas started the whole thing right on Easter. Started the whole thing the very first time because he wasn't there. And he didn't see it. And he's saying, unless I do this, I'm not going to believe it. This was his requirement for belief. He had established a standard. Some people will say in our culture today, they'll say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You may have heard this before. And really what that means is, in order for me to believe, I have my specific requirements before I will accept it. I'm curious what what ours would be. I mean, do we need a video clip? See, I think even if we had a video clip, which one of my seminary professors always joked, all the tapes have been burned, sorry. But, But even if we had a video clip, would we, who are in the same boat as Thomas, would we would we think, oh no, no, there's a camera trick. They edited the video, they, you know, they CGI'd it. I don't know, they did something, right? For those of you who don't know what CGI is, don't worry. But all your movies have them now, right? Computer graphics. And so, so what, what, is, what, was going, what would be the evidence that would be enough? It's not extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. 
And so the extraordinary claims require evidence that's adequate for you. Adequate for Thomas. Some people will call him Doubting Thomas, and that's unfortunate. He wasn't doubting. He was unbelieving. He refused to believe. Take a look at verse 26. A week later, Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, when Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you, that's kind of a big deal. It's, you know, he would have said, if he, they would have understood the word as shalom, right? And, 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 and so it's not just like, oh, I hope it's a good day for you. I hope everything's going great. He's saying, I am bringing to you the restoration of all things. But Thomas was there. Look at verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, go ahead, bro. Knock yourself out. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Now see, this is where Thomas gets his title of Doubting Thomas because in all of our English translations, they're so rated G. You know, they're so friendly. They're polite. They translate it as doubting, but the Greek word there is apostasy, which I don't know if you guys are familiar, means unbelieving, right? It means I refuse to believe. He says stop unbelieving would be a literal translation and believe. I mean, this is what we're faced with. Is it just an April Fool's joke? Is it just mumbo-jumbo? Something to which makes all Christians annoying? Or is it hope? Is it truth? Did the old world stop dying and the new world started coming on? This is what we're faced with. This is what we're up against on Easter Sunday, which falls on April Fool's. Who is the joke on? Take a look at verse 28. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. The the word Lord there is in all caps because for him, he recognized for the first time, even though he'd been with Jesus for years, he recognized for the first time who Jesus really was. This was the God of the Old Testament standing here with nail scars in his hands and his feet and a gash in his side. And Jesus had said, knock yourself out, bro. That's a paraphrase, but you know what I'm saying. What do we do with this? Because if you're, if, you're, if you're like Lee Strobel, who was the skeptic, he's like, yeah, yeah, but I'm not in Thomas's position. I don't get to thrust my hand into his side and see for myself to feel it, to touch him. I don't get to do that. So what are we left with? Take a look at verse 29. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So I'm curious, in your life, if you're in that same position as Lee Strobel, or if you're like me and it's like, Oh, it, maybe it's just another Easter. What makes this Easter special? Take a look at the evidence, right? Take a look at all the things. And I, I, had, this, I had this idea. I was going to stack a big stack of books, but it was really heavy, and I want to carry them all. But anyway, all these books were all the evidence that Lee Strobel had read, and, and, and these were the summarized versions. They weren't the scholarly editions, or we'd have like five or six stack of books. And we would have video clips, and we'd have studies, and and then the church service would run like four hours, but it would have been fun for me. And so, you know, I was going to show you all of the evidence. There's so much. And if you're sitting there going, dude, I got, I I need, extraordinary claims require adequate proof for me. Then I would encourage you to do at least the trouble did, and to actually, honestly, allow the evidence to guide you. But if you're like me, and it's more like, but wait, how do we tell the story again? How do we if, if I am already an annoying Christian and I believe all this stuff, what does it mean for me right here and right now? Guys, this means that you're saved. This means that you have hope that is not wishful thinking, that's not based on an April Fool's joke, that's not good sentiment. This is you're putting your hope in the fact that a dude walked out of the grave, and that had never happened before, other than when he rose Lazarus and a few other folks. 
But it has never happened since. But on the last day, it will happen. And you might be saying, yeah, well, you know, that's a nice little happy story, you know, GG mate. No, actually, it is the thing which changes everything. Take a look at verse 31. Because John goes ahead and just shows all his cards by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the author of this gospel. And he says in verse 31, these things are written. Everything I've given you, I've given you all. I've given you the whole thing. Why? So that you may believe. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in His name. Lee Strobel said that he was afraid that if he became a Christian, he would have to somehow learn how to be a good person. He's like, I'm not interested in that at all. It's interesting how Jesus and and his apostle John are not talking about that at all and have not been talking about that throughout the entire Gospel of John over and over and over again. Jesus keeps saying it is not about bad people being made into good people. It is about dead people coming back to life. Anybody visit any good funerals lately? Because that's what Jesus is interested in. He's interested in hope that is real. Hope that is based on factual evidence that 1,985 years ago on this day, he walked out of the tomb. A historical event, a pivot point in human history, that from that moment, all of human history has changed. Do you know before that, we didn't have books. We had scrolls. They were kind of cool, but very, you know, just difficult. But after that, Christians created books because they wanted people to read what John and others had written. You know, before that day, there were no hospitals. But people created hospitals because we need to take care of those to defend the defenseless, to reach in and help those who are in need to go out of our way to love our neighbor because some fellow who walked out of the grave said that would really change the world. Do you know that since that day, things like the Roman Empire collapsed and other empires came in their place, but all along the way, good, bad, and ugly has been happening, a big mess. And all along the way, we keep saying every single Easter morning and a whole lot of other Sundays through the year, He is risen. And so people have hope. People have love. People have this thing, even while they're burying their loved ones, even while they're having an ocean of grief that they're swimming in, there's something that comes alongside. Joy. Now, this last part here, that you may have life in his name, let's make no mistake about what that is. It's not a spiritual life, whatever that might mean. I mean, it is, but not spiritual in the typical American 21st century definition. Spiritual in the sense that's complete and total and physical. Spiritual that means just as Christ has risen from the dead, so you and I will rise from the dead. We will walk out of our tombs. You're like, what about those people buried at sea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be really cool. I will look forward to that day when the sky rips open and he cries out to all of the dead and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That is our hope. And this idea that it's in his name. Well, now what we got to do is we got to take, you know how on good TV shows, like when they get to the end, they'll do this little montage and they'll like give you this little cool music that's playing. We won't have cool music at this moment. That comes in a minute. And, 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 they'll, and they'll have this music, it'll play, and then it'll show you, wh- where have we been this season on this TV show? Um, I want to take you back to John chapter 1. When you remember all the, the names, the, the things that were the answers that Jesus gave to the question of who is this guy? What is he all about? He is the Word of God. He is the temple of God. He is the Son of God. He is the gift of God. He is the Word of life. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the light of the world. He is the Son of Man. He is the Good Shepherd. He is the Resurrection. He is the King. He is the Passover Lamb. He is the Way, the Truth, and the Life. He is the True Vine, the Spirit Giver, the only true God. He is my Lord 
and my God. So, we can put a lot of evidence up here. I remember I told you about my books. Sometimes you guys got to come over and see my books. I got a lot of them. And then, like, I have this cool thing now. I can carry all of them with me digitally, so it's really fun. But here's the thing. There's really only one piece of evidence that matters at the end of the day. You are here right now. And the Word of God is coming to you right now. And it hits your eardrums, and they vibrate. And for those of us who are a little hard of hearing, maybe I'll speak up a little louder. But even if you can't hear it, it's on the screen. It's in the books in your chair. It's with you everywhere you go. He keeps coming to you in your life, in your situation. And he keeps saying that those who believe may have life in his name. And may I just proclaim to you today, as the guy who is just a dude standing in his stead, I have nothing to offer except his word. His word. And here is what he says to you. You have life. Not just y'all, but you as individuals. You all have life when you believe in this story, in this testimony, but more importantly, in his name. Amen. Please pray with me. Father, I ask you to take the problems that Thomas had, the problems that Lee had, the problems that we have, and I pray that you would vanquish them by your spirit through the delivery of your word. I pray that you would forgive us all of our sins and our brokenness and the things that we do to rebel against you, to keep you at arm's length, to fight against you and to pretend that you're not there and just to say, ha ha, April Fools, and all those other things. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may believe. And if we've been believing it our whole lives, then renew that faith. Re-strengthen that conviction. Equip us with the armor of God so that all of the arrows, the flaming arrows of the evil one would be extinguished. Remind us that it's not about making bad people into good people, but it's about making dead people alive. Lord, I pray to you that for those of us who are in Thomas's position, are in Lee's position, that we would, we would be given what we need, which is proof that is adequate. Your word. That which tells the story and proclaims to each other, to one another, that we are saved. Not by anything that we do, but by everything that you have done, that we've read about, that we've sung about, and that we will sing about and read about again. You are the Lord. You are God. God who came to this world, yes, to vanquish evil, but not by destroying it, but by saving those who are and giving them new life. And We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.